Good morning, everybody. It is our final day of National Sleep Week, and I am so excited that you guys have stuck with us all this week, and you are going to experience one of the best live talks ever with my dear friend, former professor, amazing colleague now, I guess, since I'm a psychologist too, right? That's right. Dr. Kevin Chapman. He has been with us before, and um, on actually our most widely viewed YouTube video. We've spoken to Dr. Kevin Chapman before about post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. um, I think we touched a little bit on anxiety yeah. and night terrors in that video, but yeah. thanks to you guys, you all love what he has to say. I know it's not, it has nothing to do with me or sweaty sheets, <laughs> um, but it's our most widely viewed uh, video on YouTube. We've had, we have over 4,000 views, so I, am, I think we even have to set a bar. Like this one, uh -oh. we need to go for like 10,000 views, right? <laughs> let's go. Okay, let's do it, let's do it. So um, Dr. Dr. Chapman, I usually call you K. Chap. Indeed. Do your patients call you K. Chap? You know, interesting. Like a lot of them do. Some okay. of them call me Kevin. Some call me Dr. Chapman. Some of the real cool ones will say K. Chap. Okay, the real <laughs> cool ones. All right. So I'm cool. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, of course. Me? <laughs> I'm cool because I sleep on wicked sheets. It's your statement. Okay, there we go. <laughs> there is my shameless plug. Um, but no, today I really want, um, since it is sleep week, I really want to focus specifically on. Cognitive behavioral therapy, anxiety, night sweats, and how we can really help your patients, our viewers, sleep better. Um, so do you want to maybe just tell us a little bit about your background and what you specialize in here at the practice? Yeah, of course. So my background is I've uh, been a specialist in anxiety and related disorders. Mm -hmm. So I treat anxiety and related disorders. I've done research in that area. I do assessment and treatment in that area. And the gold standard treatment for anxiety and related disorders is cognitive behavioral therapy, also known as CBT. It is the most widely practiced um, therapeutic practice, right, or yeah. technique. Yeah. And actually, and I was mentioning to you before we got started in our interview earlier this week with psychiatrist um, Dr. Nicholas Nicholson. She was saying, even though she mm -hmm. believes in you know some forms of medication for anxiety and depression, yeah. um, she also believes in CBT. Yeah. So can you kind of tell us what does the practice of CBT or in sessions, what does that look like? What is? Yeah, so as I said, CBT is the gold standard treatment for anxiety related disorders. And of course, sleep disruption is a part of that. So of course, naturally it helps with that as well. And I guess the basic premise behind CBT is recognizing foundationally that cogn cognition or thoughts relate to one's physiological arousal and feelings in their body and that in turn impacts behavior so understanding that the way someone interprets situations and events has a strong impact on the physiological arousal and the emotional experience that you have which also includes your behavioral response to that and oftentimes maladaptive patterns develop as a result of how we interpret situations that we've learned in the past and how those interpretations are maintained by things like avoidance behavior, looking for negative threat, having a memory bias, and things along those lines. So CBT teaches you really how to regulate your emotions, whether it be anxiety or anger or sadness or disgust, it really doesn't matter. It's just a matter of teaching you how to regulate by navigating strong emotions as opposed to pushing them away, which is what most people do when they feel a strong emotion. Okay, so in technical terms, right? I get to nerd out a little bit here. Um, in technical terms, would you say a lot of these patients are repressing um, some of their anxieties or the things that provoke anxiety? Yeah, it's interesting because I guess you say repression, is, which I would call avoidance. Avoidance, okay. All anxiety related disorders and symptoms are maintained by avoidance, okay. right? Avoidance is easy, why? Because it provides me with temporary relief. If I avoid a situation that triggers me, say I get anxious or panicky and say Target or Walmart, mm -hmm. if that happens, the, my knee jerk reaction is to get out of that situation. Why? Hashtag wipes brow, my anxiety instantly goes away. Right. But what I just did is I reinforced the distress the next time I enter that situation. So it's a vicious cycle or a hamster wheel of trying to push away an emotion that backfires mm -hmm. and perpetuates it. Right, okay. Yeah. So once we start addressing them, right. validating them, mm -hmm. and then isn't a large part of CBT um, education as well? Absolutely, there's a, a huge didactic component of CBT we call it psychoeducation where you spend a great deal of time with a client teaching them essentially to be their own psychologist that's one of my mottos when I have a client is to teach you to be your own psychologist and that requires you to know not just the how mm -hmm. but the why right not only where it came from but what maintains it today 
and understanding the research literature and stuff like that. Why? Because CBT is sticky long term. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, you shouldn't need me for the rest of your life if you learn how to use CBT effectively. Even though I'm sure this happens, you get patients that come and see you <laughs> yeah, they and <laughs> they fall in love with the um, the practice of mm -hmm. coming to see you, right? Right. Yeah. Maybe it's one or two times a week. Maybe it's mm -hmm. one or two times a month. Right. But um, have you ever seen that backfire where somebody becomes too dependent on you? Yeah, I think so. Certainly that would happen because oftentimes a lot of people because of the therapeutic context. That's where there's some safeguards within CBT to prevent that. Perfect. But certainly there's exceptions to that. There are some people who are like, you know, we really don't have any goals necessarily, <laughs> but yet I feel the need to keep coming back. Well, right, ultimately right. you have to have that conversation because you will be doing a client a disservice if you keep them in treatment forever. I love that. Yeah. So you, you learned that in graduate school, it's called ethics, right? <laughs> <laughs> be a good therapist and practice ethical standards. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember that. It's not the class so I true. took with you. Um, <laughs> nope. um, but okay, so CBT, we know this is the gold standard. Yeah. Talk to me about the um, different types of reasons why someone might come and see you. So anxiety, yeah. and I do want to talk about since it is sleep week, yeah. a little bit of insomnia. Sure, of course. So um, would someone come to you and say, okay, I panicked on a plane for the first time. I need to talk to you about it or would they come to you and say I'm afraid of the color green yeah. right or something like that yeah, yeah. what are like some of the most common reasons why someone would come and see you you know you say that and ironically I have seen someone who had a fear of green food so oh get that. out of here so absolutely so panic attacks right phobias agoraphobia which is anxiety about places where panic may occur okay right so I see a lot of people with that if someone struggles with social anxiety disorder public speaking, having small group discussions, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, people who are afraid of like f throwing up, people who have OCD, mm -hmm. obsessive compulsive disorder, people who have those sort of things. Actually skin picking and hair pulling, people see me for that as well. Oh, nerd alert. Uh, trichotillomania she said it. That's how and, you say it. and what's the other uh -oh. one what's and dermatillomania yep oh yep. man I remember these things yep. I love it so people see me for those sort of things and to your point Allie you can't really mutually exclude sleep difficulties with those anxiety related disorders because if I could give a nerd alert myself Woo. I'd say 40 million Americans per year have an anxiety disorder ironically about 40 million Americans also have some sort of sleep disorder as well and an additional 20 million Americans have some sort of sleep disruption. So uh -huh. they go hand in hand and they're bi-directional and pretty much any psychiatric condition is gonna have some sleep disturbance at some point. Mm -hmm. And um, we talked a little bit about this with Dr. Nicholson. She said oftentimes you have the disorder and um, then you have a correlation to the sleep yeah. disruption. Right. Once you start treating the sleep disruption, it's amazing what yes. you see what happens to your disorder. Absolutely true. Okay, that's good. So yeah. that is why we have always at Wicked Sheets mm -hmm practice um, basically blogging and waving our flag yeah. as like a medical lifestyle product because we know a lot of our customers, they have night sweats or hot flashes yeah. as a result of anxiety yep. or depression, yep. whether the um, condition itself or the medication they're on to treat it. Mm -hmm. um, they might have it as a side effect of night terrors or yep. post-traumatic stress disorder. Yep. So we really wanna make sure that we're taking care of people's mental health and also being able to offer them a tangible product that might help you know, um, with the symptoms that are exacerbated like night sweats and hot flashes. Absolutely true. So let's um, maybe talk about insomnia for uh, okay. a split second here because yeah. we haven't touched on it this week. Mm -hmm. um, insomnia is what for the layperson? Yeah, so insomnia is really a, a, a dysregulated sleep pattern that disrupts one's not only onset of sleep, but also their ability to stay asleep, waking up in the middle of the night, or basically have an ineffective or maladaptive sleep pattern. Okay. So insomnia is I can't sleep. Right. So whether or not I can't go to sleep or not, whether it's that or if I slept, but it really wasn't really good deep sleep, then insomnia is I just can't sleep well, mm -hmm. right? And that's something that co-occurs with anxiety and related disorders very highly so absolutely and as we've stated all week long if you're not sleeping well mm -hmm. the rest of your day your performance level you feel groggy you might not be able to um, yeah. perform your job correctly you might be an agitated parent so that's why we really want to practice this sleep hygiene yes so let's talk about a couple of tips you okay. think especially for folks with um, anxiety sure. or night sweats yeah. if you wake up in a panic or wake up in the middle of the night right. what is something um, a person can do to maybe squelch that fear or, or decrease that anxiety? Well, you know, that's a great question. We could talk all day about that. Yeah. I'd say in terms of some tips, I'd say, well, first of all, you got to think in terms of sleep disruption and insomnia, part of what maintains that alley is this idea 
that I've associated sleep time and my bedtime routine with a maladaptive negative experience. Right. Okay. Right. So sleep is supposed to a bedroom is supposed to be for sleep and sex technically and nothing else. Right? <laughs> right. So anything that occurs in the bed, reading, watching TV, screens, all really bad for sleep hygiene. Okay. So one practical tip is to make sleep a bedroom conducive to sleep and remove anything in a bedroom. For instance, we built a house and I have a wall that I could put a TV on and I literally intentionally refuse to do that because I practice good sleep hygiene. So I will refuse to put a TV in my bedroom even though it would be cool to watch a Marvel movie. Right. But nonetheless, <laughs> I don't do that because it would disrupt sleep. It's not good sleep hygiene. So one practical tip is if you have a sleep disruption, I would leave the room momentarily and do something relaxing to decrease that physiological arousal, but then return back to the sleep setting. When you're feeling tired again. When you're again. feeling tired okay. again, absolutely. So removing screens and things like that prior to sleep is very important. Another tip I'd say is practicing mindful emotional awareness. Okay. I think that's really important. There's a number of apps out there today that help you meditate. I think that you have to start winding down prior to sleep time so that your body, because think about it with anxiety and related disorders, worry and anxiety which is a cognitive process is certainly going to disrupt sleep so my body may be tired but my mind is it mm -hmm. so ultimately being able to relax by being aware of the five senses paying attention to the sounds in the room paying attention to those sort of things prior to sleep time is also a really important strategy so there's a million apps out there Really, most of them are good. I mean, anything that you can use to get you to wind down, but you got to schedule it, Allie. I think it's really important to make a scheduled time every single night to do that. I so that's so another too. really important tip is to do some mindful emotional awareness practice prior to sleep time and remove gadgets and things that would prevent you from good sleep hygiene. Because again, the thoughts help maintain disrupted sleep patterns. So if I'm thinking my bedroom is, oh crap, it's nine, that means I'm not going to be able to fall asleep. Those cognitions are going to increase the arousal of my body sure. and inhibit my sleep, right? Whereas if I can help have a different experience by changing the thoughts I have going into a sleep setting, then that's going to be very helpful, especially if I'm doing mindful emotional awareness exercises that are reconditioning and reprogramming like my circadian rhythms in my head, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And my body and my arousal, and that's going to make it more conducive to a sleep situation. Okay, I love that. I think that is so important for everyone to know. And I'll make sure on our blogs that we mention a list of those apps. I know a couple off the top of my head mm -hmm. um, are Calm. Yep. There's a CBTI. Yep. Um, Headspace, and I think. It's Headspace, one. yes, yeah. that one. Mm -hmm. So I'll make sure we put those on our blogs and link to them so that people can take a look at them for yeah, sure. That'd be great. Um, I love the idea of focusing on the here and now. Oh, yeah. I've actually heard that there are a couple questions you can ask yourself right before you go to bed. Like, what and and bringing it aware bringing that awareness to your senses so what are my feet touching right now yes where is yes, my yes, yes. um where's my skin yeah, my what back. does it feel like my where's my hair. back mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so um would you say when you're in the bed to practice that as you're calming and trying to think through and yes. gain awareness absolutely and what i'd say to your viewers ali is that i think that there are a number of apps i love audio clips oh sure if you have someone that has a soothing voice telling you to mm -hmm. do that Grounding yourself in the present moment. How does your back feel against the seat? How do your feet feel touching the floor? Mm -hmm. Pay attention to the sounds in the room. You know, where you are in the room. Picture the room outside of yourself. Those are the sort of things that a guided app would teach you. Okay. That's super effective, yes. That's amazing. Yeah. And I've also heard um, about increasing the level of oxygen to your brain helps mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. kind of just decrease that anxiety yes. and you know I could also go really nerdy on the yeah, sympathetic yeah, nervous really system and your fight or flight <laughs> I know right this is why I swear in another life I was a neuroscientist Indeed, maybe, yeah, maybe in yeah, you are. maybe in a couple of years you know, right? <laughs> but um, just talking briefly about how do you get more oxygen to your brain yeah. right how do you increase the oxygen levels in your blood flow and how does that decrease your anxiety and I know there are a handful of breathing techniques also those of which you can find yeah. on guided apps yeah. or on YouTube um, but are there any like really quick maybe I think they're called four seven eight breathing four square breathing yep. where you're just literally breathing in and counting and holding yep. for four seconds yep and then exhaling slowly out your mouth and okay that slow, that slow exhale out your mouth is very important and to your point, Ali, I think that it's important like, for your viewers to know that when we think, that we think about anxiety, we typically think about the arousal, the physiological mm -hmm. arousal. And to your point about oxygen, I think it's really important to teach yourself mastery and control, that I can actually you know, manage my arousal in my body by just simply breathing correctly. One of my mottos is since you have to breathe anyway, 
you might as well do it correctly. I love that. So doing that twice a day is helpful. I'd say that to your viewers as well is practicing. I'd say first thing in the morning mm -hmm. and right before you go to sleep is also very effective. Inhaling through your nose for four to five seconds. Think the number one. Hold it and then exhale out your mouth slowly and think the word relax with like 700 X's on the end for okay. six seconds. And then do two and then relax and do that to 10. Okay. I do that twice a day. And one quick thing I'll say about that, the reason I'd say the morning is important is because your cortisol levels in your body are highest as soon as you wake up. Sure. And that's your stress hormone. So I think that if you breathe correctly as soon as you wake up, that sets the tone for the rest of the day and you're able to effectively navigate strong emotions that way as well. That's perfect. Yeah. I think if you're practicing this when you're not in the anxiety provoking situation, yeah. you know how to right. go to it exactly. more naturally. It's automatic, right? right. Exactly. Yeah. You nailed it. Yep. Um, I love when KCHAP shares these tips with us, but it's not just with us and our viewers today. On your website, mm -hmm. on drkevinchapman.com, and I know you're pretty active on Twitter and social media, oh, yeah. you share tips and videos yep. about I different do. techniques and different articles. Um, I think you just posted one maybe about mindfulness the other day. Yeah, I was talking about worry, I think, actually. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. I, see, I read them. I go to yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're just so excited that you could join us today. I it's it. always an amazing conversation. Conversation, Thank and you. you always leave our viewers and our friends and our customers with tips that they can use. And I think you can hear a lot of different talks and you can have someone talk at you all the time, yeah. but you give tips that are relatable and useful and we really appreciate, I appreciate it. All that. of, Thank all of you. your time. I appreciate it. So it's the close of sleep week and I just want to reiterate, it's important to practice sleep hygiene all of the time, not just during sleep week, right? right? True, true, you need true. to take some of these tips that we shared with you this week and start practicing them today so that you can start sleeping better tonight. And as always, be cooler, sleep wicked. Thanks guys.